Welcome to the uh, presentation by the class of 1968, Baseball and Amherst between Japan and the United States. Uh, growing up, I played with Japanese baseballs. Um, you could throw them, but you, you really couldn't hit them. They really didn't seem to be much more than sawdust inside of a, a white cover. Um, the first Japanese cars they came over were, were very inexpensive. Uh, later they became um, very good, and then eventually they became style leaders. Uh, the, uh, the image of Japan in the United States, um, I think, changed quite a lot in the years, over the years. When I, I knew bankers in New York who were planning to uh, learn, take lessons in Japanese because they assumed the Japanese banks were going, going to take over the American banks and they just wanted to be prepared. So there was um, quite a lot of change. Um, baseball is interesting because it's been played in both countries for a long time. It's been, I think 1872 was introduced into Japan. Uh, there have been uh, Prof uh, professional barnstorming teams traveling to Japan since 1908. Uh, and in the 1970s, baseball kind of became a metaphor for the different cultures between Japan, Japan and the United States. And uh, what uh, Bill is going to talk about today is uh, changes in, in the perceptions uh, over the years. Uh, Bill earned a PhD in anthropology from Brandeis in 1980. Uh, Bill Kelly, class of 68. Um, he's only, he's, as he says, he's only had one job since he graduated. He's, he teaches at Yale and has been there ever since. Uh, He's written, among other things, he's written uh, widely on the broader dynamics of class formation in Japanese society. The common themes of his work are, one, the way Japanese society fits together, and two, the way values shift. His most recent research focuses on how sports have influenced and reshaped notions of ethnicity, gender, and citizenship in Japan and East Asia. In 2009, the Japanese government gave Bill an award called the Order of the Rising Sun, comma, Gold Rays with Neck Ribbon. Uh, these awards are, are given to in recognition of Japanese and, and United States uh, cultural exchange. Uh, that same year, a fellow recipient was Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, he told me he was happy to receive it. He wasn't quite sure why he got it, but he was happy to receive the recognition anyway. So, probably a pretty unusual uh, distinction for, for an Amherst grad. In his early days at Yale, he, he used to frequent a pizza shop where Bart Giamatti showed up. It, for those who don't know, Bart Giamatti was the president of Yale at the time and later became the commissioner of baseball. So they would talk about, uh, they shared, a, I suppose, a, a love of the Red Sox and uh, would talk baseball. Uh, Bill concluded that Giamatti was more of a romantic about baseball than a realist. So, um, okay, one last thing, Bill's book, The Sports World of the Hanshin Tigers, is, is due to come out this fall, so pick it up for Christmas. <laughs> okay. Also here is Trent Maxey, who is an associate professor of Asian languages and civilizations and history at Amherst. Uh, professor Maxey's latest book is called The Greatest Problem, Religion and State Formation in Meiji, Japan. Uh, last fall, Mike Mulligan and I sat in on one of his classes. Uh, it was 
discussing, among other things, uh, the changing attitudes of Americans towards Japanese Americans during, <clears throat> during the war. And Mike and I were, were very impressed with the rapport that uh, Professor Maxey had with his students. So they're our speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. And also thank you to you and Mike and our classmates who have put together this reunion. It was not easy to pull us here and to organize the program and the social events, and uh, we, do, we do appreciate it. Um, as, as Bob said, I've been a cultural anthropologist working on Japan, teaching at Yale for my whole career. I just, a couple months ago, uh, got my last paycheck um, and gave my last lecture, which sounds like a very stable and predictable life, work life, although it was actually quite accidental. Um, I was an anthro major here at Amherst with uh, Pete Brown and some, a couple of us were the first anthro majors at Yale, but it was my fifth major. Um, and it was only my final major because time ran out. Um, I left Amherst, I had no plans, interest in going to graduate school, but a couple of years later ended up back in graduate school. I was interested really in anthropology and working on Nepal and Tibet because I liked mountain climbing. Um, when it came to the dissertation for personal and not intellectual reasons, I switched from Nepal to Japan. So I've actually never taken a course on Japan in my life, including at Amherst. <clears throat> I finished grad school at the end of the 70s when the job market was absolutely horrible. I sent out 60-some applications to colleges and universities. The only place that responded with an interview was Yale. Um, I happened to get that job for reasons I still don't understand. <laughs> Yale in the, 1980, in the 1980s, like the 70s and 60s, the expectation was the junior faculty would come, teach for a few years, and then gracefully leave and go somewhere else. My particular department at that time was beginning to rethink that strategy, so I ended up getting tenure, staying for my entire career. I don't have any profound reflections on 50 years after Amherst, except I suspect that, like you all, you know, Mike, it's an example of life happens when you're planning for something else. It's about the only thing that occurs to me. The other thing that occurs to me in coming back is that for us at Amherst in the 60s, there were many fine things about the curriculum and the faculty and the experience, but like all other places, it was a very national place. I mean, our children and grandchildren are going to universities with semester abroad and year abroad and um, a kind of a, a global uh, a, a scale to their education. Um, their classes, my classes um, at Yale in the 90s and the 2000s have become fully international um, and, and global, but that wasn't the case obviously at Amherst or any other place back <clears throat> in the 60s. And when I think back on some of our, you know, the very few of our classmates who were coming from um, other parts of the world, from Asia and Africa and South America. There was just a handful, the kind of culture shock that they must have faced and, 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 and coming into a place that was, you know, in that sense, fairly provincial. I mean, the only agency offering experiences abroad was the U.S. Army. And the only destination we could go was Vietnam, um, which was not a destination of choice for many of us. And so in that sense, things have really changed. However, in one small respect, um, even at that time, uh, Amherst did have one international connection of enormous historical depth, a connection with a particular elite private university in Japan, not in Tokyo, but in Kyoto, the old capital, the old imperial capital down um, further, to, further to the south and the west. Um, and it was, as many of us know, um, because 
the portrait hangs in Johnson Chapel because of this one individual, Nijima Joe, Joe Nijima, um, who had an extraordinary life. I mean, this is a, as a teenager before the so-called Meiji Restoration when modern Japan in 1868 was responding to Commodore Perry. As a teenager, even before that, he made a very daring escape from Japan um, through two ships, got to New England, um, was taken in by a missionary family, enabled him to go to Phillips and from Phillips to Amherst. And he was the first BA of a Japanese student in the United States. He went back to Japan, he, he, was a, he became a Christian, uh, went back to Japan in 1875, started what he called the Dosha English School, which very quickly became a college and a university, one of the elite private universities, and retained an affection for Amherst. Amherst remembered him and had several other uh, Japanese following him, gave him an honorary degree in 1889, the year before he died um, in sort of late, in late middle age. But you know, this Amherst Doshi connection has been longstanding um, and represented, back, at least back in the 60s, one of the very few ways in which um, Amherst, in fact, had a kind of, uh, if not global, <clears throat> at least an international connection of, of real substance, and that continues today. <clears throat> and Trent is going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to talk about that. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about baseball for some of the reasons that Bob has suggested, because along with Dosia, baseball has been one of those things that have connected the United States and Japan surprisingly since roughly that time, the 1870s, um, when a couple of Japanese were in the U.S. and came back to Japan with a knowledge, enthusiasm for baseball, um, and some uh, American missionaries and teachers um, came to Japan and introduced the game that was beginning to, well, it had spread um, uh, in, in the United States from the uh, 1850s and 1860s. So from the 1870s, as the Amherst Doshisha connection was being constructed, um, baseball was also constructing a kind of relationship, um, sometimes friendly, sometimes not so friendly, uh, between the United, the United States and Japan. So we thought that that would be sort of a useful way of, of talking about Japan, Amherst's involvement in Japan, um, and uh, the ways in which baseball functioned. Now, baseball was, you know, frankly, not that important at Doshisha Nijima Joe was not a sports person. Um, base, uh, uh, Doshisha did have a baseball club from the beginning, did play these, uh, these other universities, but baseball really developed in some of the other um, universities, particularly in Tokyo, in the 1880s, 1890s. Basically, um, Baseball in Japan looks a little bit like it does in the U.S., but also a little bit different. Um, the professional league consi leagues consist of two leagues, Central and Pacific, with six teams each, sort of like the U.S. was back in the 1950s. There hasn't really been the kind of expansion that you see um, in the United States. Um, there, are, there are no minor leagues, but companies, corporations have extensive sports programs and they have some what are really sort of semi-pro quality of teams um, that compete with one another in fairly um, important uh, tournaments uh, during the year. Um, Dos Tokyo, Keio, Waseda, these, these universities in Japan have leagues and championships and tournaments. Um, high school, baseball is extremely important in high school. Not so important in the U.S. because the baseball season is in the summer when high schools are not in session. So it's other sports really in the, in, in the U.S. that has be, have become more prominent. Um, but in Japan, the school year only takes August off. So baseball actually is an important sport um, at the high school level. And Little League, they've been successful in our World, uh, world Series. Um, Little League starts you know, the same way it does for the U.S. But particularly, I bold the professional and the high school because those are the two levels that are most important in Japan. Um, their version of March Madness for our college basketball is their annual national high school tournament, not university tournament, high school tournament that takes place um, in August, the hottest month. Um, they play during the day, not in the evening. So these kids are out there <coughs> sweating, crying, um, dirty, 
Um, it is a national melodrama. It ta it's it's based on a, on regional tournaments. All of this, all of the three thousand plus high school baseball clubs are competing for the chance to go to this tournament venue. It's the same stadium every year since the 1920s. The tournament itself started in 1915. So this is enormous, even more than March Madness. There's a sense of when it is August, baseball is happening. Um, at Koshien Stadium in Osaka, year after year, every game is broadcast on national television from morning uh, to late afternoon um, and covered by the, the print press and, and the social media um, and the like. And so it becomes this sort of enormous sort of display, not so much of baseball acumen. I mean, some of these teams are good. Many of them are not. It's sort of like following your kids' sports teams in, in high school. It's more... You support them, not because they're budding pros, but because the sports are important. So there's that kind of a flavor. It's very different in that sense than, than March Madness, but it's even more um, of a nat national fixation, a national um, a, a fascination. And, you know, this is the, the most familiar ritual because every team but one loses um, in the end. And every team that loses, the players go out and they scrape up dirt, the sacred soil of Kosien Stadium that they bring back in their bags to spread on their home fields, hoping to bring luck that will bring them back the next year and finally maybe win the tournament. So there's all sorts of, there's a ritual and sentiment um, that is wrapped up um, in, this, in this high school baseball. Actually, my, when I got interested in baseball and sport and its role in Japanese society, it was actually at the professional level. Um, and I, from the mid, late 90s to the early, uh, early 2000s, I spent parts of, of six or seven seasons with one of those 12 teams. It's called the Hanshin Tigers, obviously, um, named after the Detroit Tigers, based in Osaka, the second city, um, and Kansai, the second region of Japan, second to Tokyo um, and Kanto, and spent a lot of time <clears throat> with, the, with the players, with the coaching staff, with the trainers, um, with the front office, um, in the bleachers, in the bars, with the fans, um, trying to get a sense of this team and to sort of understand <clears throat> through that team and its dynamics um, the the place of the organization of professional baseball <coughs> in, <coughs> in, in Japan. <coughs> and there are a number of things I'm not interested in talking about my book. I you know, learned in teaching over the years that assigning your own books and talking about your own books is just not good pedagogy. But I just want to point out or a couple of the larger lessons that I drew that I'm trying to communicate in that book about looking, looking at baseball, but looking at baseball even for people who aren't much interested in baseball or aren't much interested in, in sports. And really just two of those points I want to highlight um, and then turn to a final um, a larger question about U.S.-Japan baseball, and then uh, that would allow me to turn it over uh, to Trent. I'm not a sports scholar. I like sports. I played a few sports poorly. Um, but I wasn't really interested in doing a sports book. I mean, I've read a lot of sports books. Most sports books are about the team. Um, you a book about, you know, the New York Yankees is, the Yankees are the team. Sometimes there are books about the manager or star players. Um, there are other books about the fans, the fans of, uh, of in Wrigley Field. But I mean, to me, what, what makes the Chicago Cubs the Chicago Cubs, or what makes Manchester United Manchester United, or what makes the New York Yankees the New York Yankees, is something much greater than the players themselves. So if you're going to write about it, if you're going to try to understand, you're going to try to conceptualize what is, what is the New York Yankees as a kind of phenomenon, what is the Hanshin Tigers as a phenomenon, it's really not just the players, it's not just the fans, it's the ways in which, in this case, at least five different elements are sort of related to one another, together construct this thing that we know about and some people really care about um, as the Hanshin Tigers. So in the work I was doing and in, in the writing that I was doing about Hanshin, I was trying to write 
a, a study that looked a little differently about a sports place, a sports team, than the, the standard uh, uh, sports books. Um, of course, it began with the players. Um, this roster, though, suggests some of the differences with an American major league team. There are a lot of people there. As I said, there, there are no minor leagues in Japan. So these 12 professional teams each year are drafting only a small number, you know, maybe five, six, eight, nine players into their organization. There's a first team and a second team, to be sure. And the first team is 25 players who play the major league games every night. But the team looks much more like an NFL team than an MLB team, much more like professional football. And it is, you know, you've got 70 players on the roster, which means the manager and the coaching staff are going to function more like NFL teams um, with much sort of stricter lines of authority and, and organization and, and structure to the way the team works than a major league baseball team that can, that can rely on several levels of minor leagues to do the training, to do the winnowing, to do the disciplining of the players before they get to the major league. So the player structure already suggests some um, some differences between the way ba professional baseball is working um, in the two places. I mean, some of it is, is the same. Um, I mean, baseball careers are just as brief there as they are. I mean, we think about, when we think about players, you know, Ted Williams, whatever, long, but, you know, most players only last two or three years at the major league level. I mean, this is not a career that you want your kids going into um, because there's not much future, there's not much pre present, let alone future, to these kinds of careers, and it's the same in Japan. Um, they're not company employees, you know, like bank employees, despite the images that we have. So in all sorts of ways, um, the players are baseball players, they're professionals, um, but they're working in a slightly different organizational context, as is the manager and the coaching staff. Um, I mean, this is a manager who's running then 70 people, 20 coaches, um, but is beholden to a front office. In the Hanshin case, there are 100 people in the front office. I mean, front office is a misnomer because they're really backstage. Nobody ever knows the front office. In fact, in that stadium, the, the front office of the Hanshin Tigers is literally underneath the bleachers in the, in the back of the stadium. So these men and women sort of at their desk working late at night are... are, are you know, the, the feet of the fans are pounding on the, on the ceiling of their offices. It's really an interesting sort of spatial dynamic. But the front office itself in Japan is a subsidiary of the Hanshin Electric Railroad Company. You know, as some of you know, the 12 teams are owned by corporations, not wealthy individuals or, or investors. And that changes the dynamics somewhat. These corporations are interested in the teams for their PR value. Um, and some of them, like Hanshin, can be just as intrusive as those old Red Sox owners were, getting meddling in the team, meddling in, in the front office. So the manager is really, on the one hand, he's a kind of warlord over 70 players, but on the other hand, he's just a division head um, in this larger corporate and puts him in um, all sorts of, of complicated uh, dynamics. The stadium is a third element. I mean, it's inert. But it's, it's the place in which it's at. It is Koshien Stadium. That really is important to understanding the Hanshin Tigers because they're playing in the same stadium that this annual high school tournament happens. It was a stadium that was built by the Hanshin Corporation. Still owns it, still runs it. It's really Hanshin Koshien Stadium. And what that means is if you're a Hanshin player, you probably played there as a high school kid. You know, so you grew up, and, Hans, and Koshien was just the mecca of all of your ambitions and all of your, all of your interests in, in baseball. So you get there as a Hanshin player, and it's both the pinnacle of your professional ambitions, but also the most anxious, I mean, to have to play there rather than anywhere else. I mean, just the weight of, of tradition that hangs over every game makes playing for Hanshin in Koshien, um, a really sort of extraordinary experience. But also for the family, I mean, any of you who attend sports venues frequently know that it's not just an inert venue. I mean, your home stadium 
you walk in and it's it's the visual it's the smells of the stadium it's the sounds of the stadium it's the textures of the walls and the seats and i mean it's a multi sensory experience and to do that day after day after day sort of really sort of puts you into as as a player as a manager as a reporter as as a fan it really puts you into that space and that place it really creates the hunching attire experience and Koshien it goes back to 1924 like Fenway it's been little changed over the decades so it has that it, it, it has that sort of feel that 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 that, as I say, that that weight which is both pride and anxiety of being in that place which gives the fourth element, the fans, you know, a particular sort of electricity. And Hanshin Tiger fans are known in Japan as the most exuberant, the most uh, 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 independent, um, the most critical, the most supportive, the most frenetic, the most organized um, fans in Japan. Um, an American baseball fan coming to Japan, well, what kind of a sport have I come into? Because you've got, particularly in the bleachers, you have several hundred f fan clubs who, go, who have block seats. They're organized into two larger associations. Um, they have several ranks of, of cheer leaders. Um, for every batter who comes up, there's a particular hitting march that they sing from start to finish um, at different points in their different songs. There are drums, there are trumpets, there are flags, um, there are megaphones that are clacking. I mean, it is, just, it is a raucous experience to go to any uh, professional game, but particularly in Koshien Stadium for the Hanshin Tigers. And these fans exist um, as an organized pressure group on the players, on the management, on the coaches um, that are essential to, as I say, this any notion of what Hanshin Tigers um, is. They're most famous. <coughs> they, it's, it's not a seventh inning stretch in Japan. It's a seven inning balloon release in Koshien midway through uh, the, the, the stadium <coughs> as the Hanshin Tigers are coming to bat. There is a break. And the stadium holds 50, 55,000 people. You know, 53,000 of which may be supporting the home team and the other 2,000 are stuck in the left field bleachers supporting the visitors. And everyone is blowing up um, this three-foot balloon. You will recognize why it's called a condom balloon um, <laughs> or nicknamed a condom balloon. Um, and it is released. It's not tied. It's sort of held. The, science, the song is sung. They release it. It takes 10 minutes for the crew to clean up 53,000 balloons that have blown all over the stadium onto the field. But as I say, it's, it, it creates this experience. Um, the television you know, put microphones through the stadium so that you don't have to be there you know, to be drawn into this experience of watching and spectating and supporting um, the Hanshin Tigers. And finally, <clears throat> there's the media. Which, again, is quite similar to sports media in, in the U.S., although with a few important uh, changes. In, <clears throat> in Japan, most people in urban Japan commute on trains and buses and subways. They don't drive. Talk radio didn't really develop because you, you, when you get on the train, <clears throat> you open a newspaper. You know, in the U.S., you get in your car, you turn on the radio. You can listen to sports talk radio in the 70s and 80s and 90s. In Japan, the print media is still quite important. And in Japan, although most households subscribe to a national newspaper like USA Today or the U.S. Times, the, the national papers don't really have much of a sports section. Instead, they support <coughs> these sports daily newspapers. In Osaka, there are five of them competing with one another for news and sales and attention, which means that, you know, this is the press box at Koshien, open to, you know, the, the comments of the spectators around you. Um, this highly intrusive, I mean, it makes the Yankees and Red Sox media attention seem, seem elementary compared to the focus that is given, particularly the Hanshin Tigers, from morning before practice starts until um, late evening after, after the game is over. They're hanging out at the corporate owner's house overnight to try to catch him as he goes out to get his newspaper or milk in the morning to, to get him with a question. He refused to talk to the media. Um, but <clears throat> instead of getting them at home, you pick up these newspapers, or you did, on the subway platform or um, on the street before you got on the bus, and they were designed to give you 
the Hanshin Tigers. The Hanshin Tigers were front page, second page, third page um, of these sports papers. And these are amazing. These are, these are manga. I mean, they're sort of based on manga art um, with the use of graphics and visuals and, and multi-layers and multi-colors <clears throat> multi so that even if you don't buy a newspaper, you get on a subway and half the people are reading these papers and you know by the time you get to work exactly what happened with the Hansing Tigers the night before and its game. So there's ways in which the, the print media actually diffuse, even for people who don't care about baseball, um, diffuse throughout the region a sense of the Hansing Tigers and, and, and what they did which was generally to lose. This is the other interesting thing about the Hansen Tigers. They lost year after year after year from the 1970s to the early 2000s. Um, and that, that sort of raised an interesting. The other thing is not just all about art and visuals. The sports papers have some of the most complicated sabermetric statistics. They, they created a box score that we still have not yet um, emulated such that, and I won't go through it, but you can, you you can look at that and you can follow every single at bat um, through the course of the game. You know what's happening, you know, grounder to second, you know the statistics of the game, the statistics of the season. So it appeals to, you know, the sort of the rational, cerebral, statistical fascination that baseball holds, um, as well as to the emotional, sentimental um, attachment um, to, 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 to the tires that are sort of critical as well as celebratory. Um, which leads me actually to, to, this, to the second point, this question of why support the team that, that loses all the time? There were actually three teams uh, in the Kansai around Osaka um, in the 90s, in the early 2000s. And when I began looking at baseball, I actually paid equal attention to all three teams. This, you might recognize, was the team that Ichiro played for before he came to the US. He was the player of the year. That team won the Japan Series several years. They were totally ignored in the sports papers and in, 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 in the regional attention. Kintetsu Buffalo, um, another railroad team. Nomo was the star pitcher. And Nomo you know, had then, then fool, uh, fooled the owner, came to the US. Both of these teams had really strong records and profiles and were completely um, ignored by the regional population, by uh, by the, by the regional. So the, the other, or one of the other issues that I was trying uh, that interested me in the book, why the Hansen Tigers? Well, one one of the reasons is obvious. Osaka is to Tokyo as the second city is to the first city, and those other two teams played in the Pacific League. In the Central League, the, 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 the kingpin of the Central League was the Tokyo Yomiuri Giants, which is like Real Madrid and Man United and the New York Yankees all wrapped in, up into one. It was the most important, dominant, hegemonic uh, team in Japan. And the Hanshin Tigers of those three teams was the team that played against them in the league. They met 20-some times a season. So obviously, the Hanshin Tigers would bear um, the, 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 the sentiment, the weight of this second city. In fact, Osaka and Tokyo had been throughout the first half of the 20th century roughly equal. So Osaka lost its, its parity with Tokyo around the time of the Tokyo Olympics, 1964. And around that time, sentiment started to move to the Hansen. So part of it, even though they lose, it's, well, yes, you lost because Tokyo always wins. Tokyo wins every time, like London or Paris or Athens. I mean, it's, that's the way the country came to be set up. So there was a certain, you know, certain obvious reasoning to um, why the Hansen Tigers were, were so, were, 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 uh, captured so much. I mean, almost all um, of the region's uh, fixation and generated such fan response, such player um, ambivalencies that actually created other ways in which the Tigers developed this really distinctive identity and following. They say, I mean, sports are really men's versions of soap operas. Uh, I mean, you say soap operas now to kids, you know, they grew up with reality TV and the like, but soap operas, most of you understand soap operas, um, and soap operas, you know, have these wonderful qualities of there are multiple plots going on at the same time, 
that are seldom resolved and they move in different, at, at, at different paces and characters come in and out and it's very melodramatic that is sort of the, the, the exaggerated feelings of, of love and hate and, 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 and enmity and amity are expressed um, in, in these. So, and sports are like that, or at least watching sports, at least professional sports. And I think part of the draw, I mean, once you're drawn in, if you're not drawn in, it's like, so, who cares about soap operas? Uh, but if you're drawn in, you know, part of it is it, it has this sort of ongoing um, highly emotional, and, and in sports you have, you know, you have our team and their team. So the, the sort of what's at stake and the, the, uh, and, and the ups and downs of emotions are even tighter. So there's this, and, and, and a daily newspaper and a daily TV broadcast and a sport that takes place every day. It's not like American football that happens once a week. It's every day. So things happen, the game is over, the hunting tigers lose, but then there's tomorrow night. You know, I can read about it in the paper, and you can follow, you know, all of the, you know, the criticisms of the firing of the manager, the, the, the owner's problems. It's all displayed on the front page of the newspaper every day. You come to know more about the players um, and the team and the owners and the managers than you know most of your work colleagues. Um, and you see them up close, you know, their faces and their expressions in their bodies on the TV every single night. So there's a, there's a kind of, you don't know them at all. You've never met them face to face, but there's a kind of intimacy among the, the media and the players and the, and the fans, I think, that is sort of, that is greatly exaggerated by the way the Hanshin Tigers are put together and the way they function uh, within this particular city. And as I say, it's not unique. You can find that in Barcelona. You can find that in Manchester. You can find that in Liverpool. You can find that in Chicago. But so I say it, there's something about why sports are compelling for at least some people. Um, and I think it's found there as much as in just watching really elite athletes perform feats that, that we, we, can, we, can, we, can only, we can only imagine. And so, you see, in a sense, I mean, to me, looking at the Hanshin Tigers, what I came to look at was less what was going on in the game by those nine players and more everything else that really created something that everybody recognized, either felt really powerfully attracted to or powerfully repelled um, as, as, as the Hanshin Tigers. And um, part of it was the particular place that Hanshin had within Osaka, Osaka had within Tokyo. Part of the place was the ways in which it could, it could be experienced through life. Um, in these kind of soap operatic terms. And finally, I said on, on that previous slide, workplace, yes, they're looking at baseball as baseball, but they also recognized that it was, I mean, they were, Osaka is a city of small offices, small factories, subsidiary companies. Every day they're in their workplace, they're dealing with, you know, workplace relations. They come to the ballpark at night and they're seeing in Hanshin, you know, some of the same dynamics, some of the same aspirations, some of the same frustrations that, and they're reading about them in the paper. So the Hanshin Tigers, the, it's a particular kind of soap opera, sort of a soap opera that, that is, is a funhouse mirror version of their own workplaces, their own work lives, their own their own work uh, work career. So I think in lots of ways, um, it, it 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 goes towards explaining why, despite um, this these decades of well failure in the sense of losses, not failure in the sense of creating meaningful sort of experiences for for the player for the players for the media for the fans. Let um, me turn to sort of a final point to uh, bring Trent up here, which is this larger question, which actually nobody thinks about in Koshien's take. And you're watching the Tigers. You're watching the Tigers against the... You're not thinking about U.S., Japan. But as Bob said, it is true that because baseball has such a long history in the two countries, because baseball for much of the 20th century was the national pastime, not sumo, of Japan as well as uh, as well as the as well as the U.S., there have been these exchanges. There have been, you know, in the last couple of decades, American players playing for Japanese teams. More recently, if you know anything about. Japanese baseball, it's probably because of Matsui with the Yankees um, or Ichiro with uh, Seattle just retired uh, uh, last month or, you know, the latest heartthrob Otani um, with, with the Angels. That is, these Japanese players coming over. And when they come over, you know, there's this tendency to 
to, to nationalize what's going on. Here are these Japanese players coming from this baseball culture on the other side of the world that must be radically different from anything that they're experiencing here. And likewise, the American players going to Japan are coming into a baseball culture that's just the, the radical opposite of everything. You know, in Japan, it's all about teamwork. In the U.S., it's all about individual. Well, this is a team sport. You know, any team sport at Amherst is, is this constant tension between playing for the team, playing for the manager, and playing for yourself, particularly if you're a professional. So they're really... There are really two different ways of, of thinking about U.S., Japan, through baseball and through other things. You know, any, anyone who's read about Japanese baseball has read Robert Whiting, an American who's been living there 40, 50 years, writes brilliantly, is, is enormously knowledgeable about Japanese baseball, and his books have been widely influential. His view of the relationship is as his title, subtitle suggests, and as my kind of snarky uh, 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 bottom line suggests, is that there's Japan, there's the U.S. These are two different baseball. They're two different, radically different sorts of baseballs. The other view is, I mean, it's a New Yorker cartoon, but you know, like some New Yorker cartoon, they contain, you know, this element of real wisdom and this notion of ballpark sushi. It, when I first saw that cartoon d several decades ago, it reminded, you know, Sigmund Freud wrote about the uncanny. He was using it in a slightly different way, but the sense of you see something and, oh yes, that, you know, that's it. That's, that's, it's just like, I, it's me and it's just like it's home. But then you look a little closer and no, it's not quite that. So the, the, un, the sense of the uncanny is the sense of something that is is and is not what you what what, what you uh, think to be something that is close to you, and and baseball works that way. And U.S. Japan, it it's sort of it's it's very much like us in in ways that I've talked about. It's the same rule books. They're sort of translated. It plays. There's a there's a, there is a framework of similarity, but there are also some subtle and but nonetheless important distinctions between the two, um, and. To me, thinking about baseball that way, thinking about sports that way, thinking about cultures that way. I mean, this is actually the lesson that I'm trying to cultivate in my students in courses that have nothing to do with Japan and nothing to do with baseball. That Everywhere we go and travel and the experiences we have, Many times it's really this kind of Freudian, un you know, it's, it's religion, it's family, it's different, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a ceremony, it's a festival, it's a sport. It looks very much like what we experience back home, but it's a little bit different. And what's really, it seems to me, what's most important and what's most fascinating and what's most rewarding is not to try to see things as A and B, X and Y. Japanese baseball, but really to try to get at that constant sort of tension between um, the similarities that we can savor um, and the distinctiveness um, of these experiences. And so that's the way in which I'm really, you know, not focused on baseball so much, not even focused on Japan and sport, but trying as an anthropologist um, to get those students to a disposition um, about it's not about tolerance. It's about really uh, uh, savoring the uncanny in the in the construction of life. Um, I mean, I'll go beyond. That. And I think that was actually one of the things that the Amherst team took from their experiences in Japan. Um, Trent was much more involved than I in the organizing of that trip and the fundraising for that trip in the trip itself and what happens afterwards. And he also, as, 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 a, as a Japan person who's actually taking courses on Japan, um, probably much able to pick up my thread and carry it forward. So thank you very much and please welcome uh, Trent. prepared to say, but I want to start in part by kind of giving a tribute to Bill because it's a tremendous uh, privilege to teach anything related to Japan at Amherst. 
um, in part because there's a long history between Amherst and Japan. And Bill is one of those connections. Um, when I teach my survey of modern Japanese history, I assign a great deal of John Dower, class of 57, and I assign a great deal of Bill Kelly. Bill Kelly is a historian's cultural anthropologist. And when I tell the students, you know, oh, we're reading Dower today, Dower class of 57, they sit up a little more. <laughs> and we say, oh, we're reading Bill Kelly today, class of 68, they sit up a little more. And in fact, one of the essays I assign is hinged on Bill's work. Bill has this tremendously thoughtful, intelligent framework called Regional Japan, which really opens a lot of windows in talking about um, complex processes of social change, economic integration, and so on in Japan in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and so I want to kind of uh, give, give Bill the due he deserves. Um, but also, I was really, really thrilled to find out. I was ashamed that I just found out when we were in the lead up to this that you were finishing this book on the Hanshin Tigers um, because I was a young lad of 11 <laughs> in 1985. Oh. when the losing Hanshin Tigers <clears throat> won the Japan series. And that was a tremendously exciting year for a little boy in Japan to watch baseball on television. And so much of what Bill explains makes sense to me because that's how I grew up ba with baseball. Um, and Hanshin fans were truly unique. And one, one, I think, anecdotal episode to amplify what he was talking about is one of the reasons why the Hanshin Tigers managed to win and win big in 85 was they had an American on the team named Randy Bass, and Randy Bass could rake. It was, he, was, he was the man of the year. And the Hanshin fans loved Randy Bass. And every time you watch the Hanshin Tigers play in Koshien, they had an American flag, but it was an American flag that had about 18 American flags <laughs> stitched into one. It was enormous. And they waved this thing from the first baseline every game. And they loved Randy Bass. And, but that's, I think, so much uh, fusion there about uh, Hanshin Tigers and Osaka fan culture. Um, but I wanted to use that as a, as a bit of a lead-in just to say a few things about the Amherst Osha baseball tour. This was a tremendous undertaking of which I was really just a tag-along. Um, it was a tremendous privilege to go on this trip. Um, and a lot of the cliches about sport and cultural exchange um, held true, they rang really true in the sense that, I don't, think I, I don't think I'm wrong to say not a single one of the Amherst baseball players had taken a class on Japan or taken any Japanese language courses. So this is their first contact with Japan. And there were maybe a handful of players on the Dosha team who spoke a little bit of English, but most of them, no, there just was not gonna be any uh, kind of language communication going. But when we got there, we had a schedule of a couple practices um, and then a couple games, but they decided kind of impromptu they were going to mix the squads, right? So they, they had a half Amherst, half Dosha squad and a half Amherst, half Dosha squad play a scrimmage. And it was just a hoot to watch them do this. And it was like they didn't need English. They didn't need Japanese because they, it sounds really cliche, but they spoke baseball. Right? There was absolutely no nothing. And it was a lot of fun watching the batteries. Right, So you'd have a Dosha pitcher and an Amherst catcher or vice versa, and no problems. Um, and they really had a tremendously good time. And it was just a kind of reminder that, you know, kind of amplifying Bill's final point, that there really isn't much of a divide in terms of the sport. Um, and it was a, a great experience. And another thing that we did was we, we took the team around. We, we hit the sites, and Sam Morse uh, was very, very influential in getting us into some hard-to-get-to temples and shrines and so on. Um, but we went to Tokyo, and we went to the Tokyo Dome to watch the Tokyo Yomiuri Giants play the Hanshin Tigers, which was an experience. <laughs> Um, and it's also, I said, and I grew up hating the Giants, which is why I'm a Red Sox fan. Because um, we all hate the Yankees. Um, but it was, so that was, they, they got that. But then I think the other really in, important aspect of the trip was we went up to Sendai, which is the region of Japan that was hit by the 311 earthquake and tsunami. Um, and they really wanted to make sure that the Amherst team got to do a kind of, uh, kind of social work experience. So they found a, a middle school. Um, that was in a school district that was still heavily impacted by the tsunami. In fact, in the, the kind of school ground in the back, there were still kind of prefab 
kind of FEMA-like housing for people displaced by the earthquake when we were there in 2014, and they held a baseball clinic for the local Little League teams. Um, and that was, again, another instance where, you know, these little Japanese kids have absolutely no English, the Amherst team have no Japanese, but they did a day of baseball clinic and then they did a little scrimmage at the end. Um, and that was a very, very uh, special experience. Um, and it was a lot of fun watching the little kids look up at the Amherst players and so on. Um, but also anecdotally, this is Sendai, this is pretty far away from Osaka. That evening, my colleague Sam Morse, uh, he and I went out to meet with a Japanese colleague at a bar kind of a, a back, back part of the city, but it was a Hanshin fan bar. <laughs> and so this, this is just, you know, this is far away from Osaka, but it was the Hanshin Tigers everywhere. So it's, it's a kind of national story. But that's really kind of all I wanted to add because I think Bill, Bill gives us so much and uh, just really excited to have you back and okay. hope, you, hope we can have you back again and again. So okay. thank you. We have until, I mean, they said 10 o'clock. Why don't you take questions? So if yeah. you, if, if, for either of us, if there are <laughs> I'll just sit off to the side. Question, uh, if you're in, the uh, Santa Haro oh, uh, wrote a book uh, about 35 years ago, and I don't really remember the details of it. Mm -hmm. It was the strangest baseball book I ever read. It was <laughs> really quite metaphysical. Oh wait, uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that, uh, and it, it's a it, it that's a very good description. It's a very strange book, but he's a he's a very strange, very admirable, and this, so this is a book, and it has that kind of you know samurai image on the front, but there are a couple of things about O oh, that people don't understand. One is that he's not Japanese, you know, he is the Babe Ruth, the Hank Aaron of Japan. But he actually was born to a Taiwanese father and a Japanese mother in Japan, but he still is a Taiwanese citizen, although he was born in, he went to school in Japan. But he was, it was very complicated. He was, he was, he was, he was taken by the Japanese people as a Japanese national hero, and they chose to ignore his somewhat colonial foreignness. Another thing was, that he did, he didn't actually practice Aikido. He he was almost washed out in 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 his first couple of years of the pro, and they almost cut him because he couldn't hit, he couldn't do anything. And then one of the coaches took him aside and gave him this kind of sort of introduction to spiritual like training. And the book talks about that in a really interesting way. But things like they took him to an Aikido dojo, but the coach said. You know, you can't actually do it because you might get hurt. So O had to sit there actually and watch the coach and the master go at it in Aikido and try and absorb. So there are all sorts of strange things that run against the stereotype of here's this quintessential Japanese hitter who became the star because of Zen like samurai discipline. The other, the final thing is apropos of the giant, he, he was playing for the Tokyo Giants, the Yomiuri Giants from the 1950s and his teammate Nagashima, this was the pair, the dynamic duo, the Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle of Japan, literally at that same time. The two of them um, were hit home runs the Giants won nine Japan series in a row. That's what made them the iconic emblematic national team of Japan. But there's a point in the in the autobiography, late in the autobiography, he says in passing, you know, in the 25 years that Nagashima and I were teammates playing every game, we never once went out drinking together. Now that's the most un-Japanese thing one could imagine. The, the two stars of that team, they had this very uneasy relationship. And again, people were willing to sort of look beyond that too, but so to create an image. But that book is fascinating for for playing sort of the image against the reality. And, and if you want a, a sense of, of Japanese baseball, first of all, Robert Whiting's books, you know, d despite that framework, are really, are really wonderful and entertaining. But that is also a fascinating uh, sort of autobiography that's set in the, con the spirit of the, the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Uh, in this country, Major League Baseball salaries started diverging from reality 
in the 60s. Uh, what's the situation today in Japan in terms of the salary structure versus the working man's wage? Um, well, I would say they're roughly about a third of major league salaries. And so they depart significantly from everyday working wages and salaries, blue collar, white collar, to be sure. They begin, because they're no minor league, you know, in the U.S. you can give them a minor league contract for a couple thousand dollars. Maybe the number one draft will get, you know, nowadays a million or so. But the pay for the the bottom two thirds of the professional pyramid is pretty pretty low and uh, and it, and it gets high in Japan it's much flatter because these twelve teams are 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 drafting players from high school from universities some from company teams and they're only doing five or six of them and they're giving at least two or three of them million you know million dollar bonuses sometimes more so they start with a higher salary. I mean, every one of those 70 players is making at least $500,000. The top players are not making, you know, as much, and that's why, it's one of the reasons why some are coming to the U.S. So it's a slightly different, you know, it's a flatter scale that has a lower ceiling, uh, but that also means they're more reluctant to get rid of the, the players they draft because they've invested a million dollars in them. So they keep them on, and you've got, you know, it's, it's, 20 of those 70 players, you know, could barely make the Amherst Baseball Club after, after a while. But you don't, you're reluctant to, you know, to drop them. Yeah. I don't know whether this pertains to the realm of the metaphysical or the uncanny, but relative to American players going over to Japan to play there or getting any exposure in the Japanese baseball media, do they have people from Dominica over there? Uh, and how are they received? They do, uh, and Cuba. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Soriano. Uh, Soriano was a shortstop for the New York Yankees. Before that, he was a second team for the Hanshin Club. I, and I saw him there when he was with Hanshin, and he was out sweeping uh, the infield after a practice game. And what happened was Hanshin Club set up um, a an academy, as you may know, in the Dominican Republic, and brought in players. Other uh, teams have as well. The predominant foreign baseball players in Japan are Americans. They tend to be Americans you've never heard of, like Randy Bass. That is, AAA players who who realize that their pathways blocked that they don't they're probably not going to have a shot at the middle league or a major league player who you know after two or three years has kind of reached the limits and uh, they're not they're not the play in in Japan when Matsui comes over he's a national hero in 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 Japan for us the players that like go Randy Bass nobody nobody ever knew about so there's a there's a difference in in the flow but there's also now increasingly Cuba Dominican Republic Mexico Venezuela a couple of Australians um, and a few from uh, uh, Taiwan and Korea um, it's still it, it's it, you know the U.S. thirty 38% are Dominican Republic players now, um, or from the Dominican Republic, Dominican background. In Japan, it's probably only 15% uh, of the 800 players. Um, In that same vein, yeah. would you say a little bit more, um, is, there, is there any organized system, and I'm, I'm asking this question because of an experience I had. I was in Sri Lanka, yeah. where the, almost the only sport is cricket. Right. And I'm walking across athletic fields, and I double touch, there was a baseball game going on, being played by Sri Lankans. <laughs> and I asked them what the deal was, and a, a Japanese, some Japanese entity, and I don't know whether it was a very informal thing or an organized system, that's my question, had, had brought gloves, balls, bats, and some training to this university in Sri Lanka. And mm -hmm. I wondered, is that something that's happening in general, or is this just an oddity? I think it's more of an oddity. It's not unique. Uh, Trent talked about the 19, this rare moment when Hanshin actually won something. The only time they ever won the Japan Series. The manager of that team, two years later, they were at the very bottom again. He was fired. He went to France 
and he became the manager of the French national team, um, which you know consisted of the only twelve people in France who knew how to play baseball. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's, it's I mean, it's, it talk about a come down from being the Japan Series champion in Osaka to, to you know going out to the park with twelve guys and trying to play baseball with it. But so there is a sense you know some of that happens. The only other, the interesting thing was during World War II, when the Americans started, the American Army and Navy started taking back the Pacific Islands that had been overrun by the Japanese, the, and the civil engineer commenced to build a runway. They looked around, and on a number of these islands, these local people were playing baseball. And they said, What's going on here? And they realized that actually the Japanese soldiers had been teaching them baseball when they occupied these Pacific islands. And so when the Americans showed up, they wanted to play baseball with them. And there's some wonderful Saturday Evening Post covers and stories about um, the U.S. finding baseball where the Japanese had done the initial, uh, the initial teaching. I would just add that for, yeah. for that reason, the, the reason there's a professional baseball league in Taiwan and Korea yeah. is because of Japanese colonization. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So there's, there's that parallel to cricket. So right. they did take baseball with them to their colonies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to, and you're, you're getting at my question right now, and my question is I want some sense of how this model you have for the Hanshin Tigers and how they're managed and run and understand the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese, how does it play over time? For example, when did Major League Baseball start? When did the High School World Series start? And did they hit the ground the same way we're seeing them today? Or did the war have something to do with the way they, they do this? Yeah, no, My question is question. almost too large for you to answer. Right. No, no, it's an excellent, I mean, just a couple of quick points, though, yeah. because it's really an important question. And I mean, baseball started in the 1870s, and you know, it started in the US in the 40s and 1850s. The Civil War did a lot to spread baseball to make it a, a national sport in the US. But baseball, it was a school sport. And Koshien was built for, well, then it was a middle school term. So baseball developed as a school sport, was sort of school spirit. That's why, you know, partly why uh, the, 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 the cheering is the cheering that it is. There was a professional league of eight teams in the 1930s. The wartime interrupted that. They tried to restart it. And one of the, it's an interesting story, then the eight teams got together, other companies wanted to join. And they went to the occupation, General MacArthur, said, we want to get baseball going. And MacArthur, you know, who had personal con you know, decision making over lots of things about Japanese society, sort of said, well, you know, I'm not so sure about the martial arts, but baseball, that's, you know, that, may be, that may be good. But you have to have two leagues. He said, one league is too autocratic. And so you have to, you have to copy the American, American League National League. So he demanded, as a condition of restarting baseball, that you create a central league in the Pacific, I mean, that's what they call it, you create two leagues. There were already companies involved, that's why companies in Japan are financing and operating professional baseball, unlike the wealthy individuals in the US. So there, you know, there are these interesting historical reasons that created, really by the 1960s and 1970s, the kind of things that I'm, talk <coughs> that I'm talking about here. Even now, it's changing. You, go, you get on a subway or a bus in, in Osaka now or Tokyo now, and you look around, you don't see a single newspaper. I mean, subscriptions at home continue, but you know, people are on their smartphone. You know, they're playing games. They're, doing, they're not even reading the papers on the screens. And you think about it. That says remarkable, if, if for, for 30 years, you, you lived hunting tigers through these manga-like front pages of the sports papers that, that, that covered you know, your transportation experience day after day after day, that rose like fountains in these newsstands, and they disappear. That, that changes your whole sort of daily visceral experience of, of the Hansing Tiger. So there, I mean, even more recently, there have been remarkable changes in the ways in which baseball is, is organized and experienced. 